compromise can be so much more severe. Tampering with an old-fashioned ballot box can affect a few hundred votes at most, but injecting a virus into a single computerized voting machine can potentially affect an entire election. Two weeks ago, my colleagues Ari Feldman and Alex Halderman and I released a detailed security analysis of this machine, the Diebold AccuVote TS, which is used in Maryland, Georgia, and elsewhere. My written testimony summarizes the findings of our study. One main finding is that the machines are susceptible to computer viruses that spread from machine to machine and silently transfer votes from one candidate to another. Such a virus requires moderate computer programming skills to construct. Launching it requires access to a single voting machine for as little as one minute. I will now demonstrate this using a virus we constructed in our laboratory. Thank you. It is the tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you all rise and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Our first witness is uh, Secretary Jack Jay Johnson. Uh, Secretary Johnson is the fourth Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Prior to leading DHS, Secretary Johnson served as General Counsel for the Department of Defense, General Counsel of the Department of the Air Force, and Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. Secretary Johnson. Thank you, Chairman, Senator Carper, Senators of this committee. You have my prepared statement. I will not read it. I will just say briefly a couple of things. Um, one, uh, I have talked repeatedly about how we see the global terrorist threat evolving and the threat to our homeland evolving from uh, terrorist-directed attacks to a global threat environment that now includes terrorist-inspired attacks uh, of the type we've seen most recently in our homeland, where an actor is self-radicalized uh, without receiving direct orders from a terrorist organization, has, as Senator Carper noted, uh, very often spent most of his life here, um, can be a U.S. citizen, can have been born here, but is inspired by things that he sees in the Internet, social media, and the like. This makes for a more complicated and challenging homeland security, public safety environment. I think I speak for all three of us when I say that the prospect of the next terrorist-inspired attack on our homeland is the thing that keeps us up at night most often. Um, within the Department of Homeland Security, as you've noted, one of the things that I've been very active in promoting is our efforts at building community partnerships, particularly with American Muslim communities. I think in this environment, it is critical that we do that uh, to encourage them. If you see something, say something. It can make a difference to build bridges in terms of grant-making activity, resources, and the like. Uh, and what are the things we need to learn from this? Because obviously, we want to prevent it in the first place. But when something like this comes through your doors, we want to make sure it's followed up on so that we can do all we can with local law enforcement to stop these things before they start. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, 
I, I will at some point want to have that conversation. I don't want to have it now for two reasons. First, this is an active investigation. This guy's alive and entitled to a fair trial, and I don't want to do anything that gives him an opportunity to claim we deprived him of that, right? And second, I don't know yet. We're going to go back and look very carefully at the way we encountered him, and we will find the appropriate form to give you that transparency about what we did well, what we could have done better, what we've learned from it. Uh, we haven't done that work yet because we're doing an active investigation. So I don't want to comment in this form beyond that right now. Well, I appreciate that, but I think this is a really important question for all of us. Um, number one, do you need different legal authorities? Number two, do you need more agents? Number three, was it something that was missed that this individual was not interviewed despite these flags? In the, or if we look at the Orlando situation, if we go back to Sarnev, all each one of them, putting them together, what more do we need to do? What uh, are the lessons learned? And if you need additional support, we need to know about it very quickly. So thank you. Senator Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank each one of you for being here today. And uh, thank you for the work you do. And a special thank to you, Jay, since this is the last time in front of this committee. Um, uh, Jay, you had brought up um, support for state governments on election tampering. Um, could you give me an idea on how prevalent this is by foreign governments? We are seeing um, a limited number of instances where there have been efforts um, through cyber intrusions to get into the online presence of various state election agencies. And one or two of them have been successful, uh, others have not. Um, but more broadly, just in the general environment, Senator, that we're in, where we have an increasing level of sophistication right. with nation state actors, hacktivists, and so forth, we've been out there saying to state election officials, if you need help, just ask us for it. So, uh, and, and they're, they're, uh, they're getting into the databases and changing the votes? That's what they're doing? No, no, I, no, that's, that's not it. There's, it. The matters are under active investigation. I think there's a limited amount we can say. Okay. But um, what we are seeing are efforts to get into voter registration rolls. Okay. Uh, the identity of registered voters, that, that, things of that nature, and not, change not to votes. change a ballot count. Okay, and change votes. So not, person, not to change votes, no. No, but, but to change so a person who would normally be registered would not be registered then? Is that what we're talking about? Or to register people who I, I cannot say that. Okay. No, all I right. cannot say that. Uh, all right. And is this coming from one particular country? Um, I don't believe that we have reached a determination uh, uh, of that nature to that extent. Okay. Uh, we talk about the southern border a lot. I always talk about the northern border. Yes, you uh, do. And I do want to talk about that for a second in the arena of communications. Uh, we have been told uh, by folks who work under you uh, on the ground on the northern border that there are gaps of communication on the northern border. Are you aware of those gaps? Number one. Yeah. Are you aware of those gaps of communication? Do they exist? It's something that I've heard about, um, and I know you have an interest in this. Um, frankly, I would not be surprised if there were some level of gaps in communications that should not exist. Right. And, and I guess the next question is, is then if you do have gaps, which is not unreasonable, it's something we need to work on, though, to get fixed, do you have workarounds on those gaps through local law enforcement or highway patrol or, or uh, municipal sheriff departments, whatever it might be? I'd have to, I'd have to get back to you on that. Could, could you check on that? Because I think sure. that that's, uh, if we have dead zones on the northern border, that, that is a particular problem of concern that, quite frankly, is pretty, pretty basic. And if you could find out and just let me know, uh, sure, uh, that would be great. Um, I, I want to talk a, a little bit about, um, since this is your last meeting, uh,